This video is on community relationships, learning targets 5 through 8 in the ecology unit. So we're going to be looking at different relationships within the, the living things of an ecosystem. Here's an example of a relationship that's not uh, going to happen in nature. You can see the dog is terrified um, for his life. Monkeys are savages. And so there are uh, different types of relationships. We're going to look at three main big heading types of relationships and then some underneath those. So the first big type of relationship that we're going to look at is symbiosis. Symbiosis is a close, long-term interaction between two organisms. They don't necessarily depend on one another, but at least one depends on the other. And so here's an example of close relationship meerkats and warthogs um, typified by the Lion King of course but um, this is a real thing. Well one type of symbiosis is an example uh, is a relationship called commensalism. Now before we talk about commensalism one way that we often denote these relationships is by using symbols and so we would say that commensalism is a plus zero relationship and what we mean by that is one organism gets a benefit the plus and the other organism gets nothing the zero it's not that he loses anything or gains anything he just gets nothing and so the example of this is the one that you see in the picture the cattle egret and that cow there or it could be a water buffalo or giraffe or whatever and these cattle egrets what they do is they'll sit on the back of this large animal and as that animal walks through the grass through the dirt it's going to stir up lots of bugs now the bugs are of no consequence to an animal that weighs as much as the cow does uh, doesn't really bother it I guess you could make the argument that if there were thousands of them maybe sure but the cattle egret wouldn't be there either but the cattle egret scoops up all the bugs and eats them and so it's a good thing to be a cattle egret riding on the back of a cow. That gets a plus, and the cow just gets nothing out of this. Uh, doesn't bother it, doesn't care, doesn't take anything away, doesn't gain anything. Another type of relationship is mutualism. And mutualism is an example of a plus-plus relationship in that both organisms gain something. An example of this is the clownfish and the sea anemone. The clownfish, uh, the, the sea anemone is a type of uh, cnidarian that has these stinging tentacles. Any other fish that comes up to it, it stings it, paralyzes it, eats it. Well, the clownfish has developed an immunity to the sea anemone. Again, this is an example of coevolution where they have kind of evolved together to benefit one another. The clownfish is immune, so the clownfish can hide inside this place, the sea anemone, where other fish can't go. And so the clownfish gets protection, gets some, uh, and as the sea anemone ga uh, gobbles up other fish and kind of drops all the leftovers around, the clownfish can eat those. The clownfish can eat the parasites that might otherwise harm the sea anemone. And as the clownfish uh, poops everywhere, the sea anemone also gets the uh, benefit of having that um, nutrition as well. And so they are able to benefit from one another just by having this relationship. There are other examples of mutualism in the wild as well. This is one of the most classic examples. Another one is called parasitism. Parasitism is a plus minus relationship in that one organism benefits, the parasite benefits, and another organism loses resources but doesn't die necessarily. Maybe dies later in the process but not at first. The host organism, the one that's keeping the parasite, isn't killed again but has its resources constantly being drained by the parasite. An example of this is a picture you see here. There are uh, these caterpillars are called tomato hornworms and they are attacked by a wasp called the brachinoid wasp. 
what this wasp does is it lays its eggs in the caterpillar and uh, when they hatch they basically feed on the blood of the caterpillar on the inside of the caterpillar without killing it and eventually they'll they'll hatch out of the caterpillar's body and it's um, it's a pretty devastating sight you can kind of see here what's going on the different the bugs kind of coming out of the caterpillar I would not think that's a pleasant thing if you're the caterpillar but the wasps get the benefit of having a nice safe place to keep their children caterpillars eat like crazy so they get food as well and the caterpillar um, serves as a home for baby wasp worms and uh, doesn't really win in this there's no way to win having baby wasp worms living inside your body so a different type of relationship that is not symbiosis again different type of relationship is competition and competition is a minus minus relationship it's a contest between two species or within a species for resources for food water territory mates anything like that that's causing them to compete with one another they're both losing think of a think of a game you go and play a football game both teams are giving energy they're both losing energy in order to win the game sure one team wins but both of them had to pay something had to give their energy in order to win so it's a minus minus even though there's a winner sure it costs both teams something and so in this case it's very similar both organisms are losing energy even though one of them might actually win the prize or win them in this case the wolves won the carcass so different types of competition one of them is interspecific this is uh, the word inter means between so this is competition between two different species like you see here the the hyena and the lion looks like they're kind of huddled up talking but they're not they're probably upset with one another hyenas and lions um, compete in the wild for food the lion typically get hunts it down and the hyena typically sits and waits until it can get its share or can run drive the lion off um, there there could easily be a, a vulture here in the background also uh, waiting its turn um, for the feast it's kind of a weird vulture but uh, yeah so you can get this idea there's there's competition going on all the time there's also intraspecific competition this is competition within the same species so like these two bighorn sheep colliding heads with one another they're fighting over a mate they're fighting over territory they're competing with one another it's costing them their own energy in order to gain some sort of prize whatever that is that's competition the next type of relationship again big type of relationship is called predation this is a plus minus relationship except for what makes this different from parasitism is one organism feeds upon another one one lives and has a belly full of the other one that dies in this case these lions are going to eat a water buffalo the water buffalo lit or dies it's the minus it's negative to die and so in a in a predation relationship there are two main parties there is the predator the predator is the one that does the eating the fox is the predator here and the bunny is the prey the prey is the one that gets eaten the gazelle is often prey it is the Snickers bar of the Serengeti and under predation is this concept of boom bust cycles and boom bust cycles represent the relationship that predator and prey have with one another and so you can see here as the number of we'll just track the fox the fox is this green dotted line what happens as the number of fox increase well the number of bunnies is going to decrease as the foxes increase because there's more foxes to kill more bunnies and they're going to de decrease so what happens when the number of bunnies decrease less foxes are going to be able to live as the foxes decrease the bunnies then 
are going to go back up. And so there's this constant back and forth between these two organisms, foxes and bunnies. You could easily, uh, the wolf and the rabbit are often used, or the lynx and the rabbit are used for this as well. But again, this relationship represents a cycle with these two organisms dependent on one another for survival. If one is removed, the other will die out. You take the foxes out of this, the bunnies will overpopulate, eat all the grass, and die. You take the bunnies out, obviously the foxes can't live very long or they'll have to find something else to, to hunt. And so this boom-bust cycle represents the relationship between predator and prey. And that brings us to a new idea, which is the idea of population dynamics. Remember, a population is just all of one species living in an area. Well, the boom-bust cycle is a type of population dynamic, and population dynamics are just a study of how populations grow and decline and other factors that contribute to that. Population density, population density is an important concept in understanding population dynamics. This is just the amount of a population in a given, in a given area. And so think of uh, the state or the city of New York is a very densely populated area as opposed to the whole state of New York, which is relatively sparsely populated in some parts. But in the city, very densely populated, people live, literally living on top of one another in these tall buildings, whereas in the countryside, like Wyoming or something, very sparsely populated area. And so with that, there are two factors that kind of play on the density of a population. One of them is called a density-dependent factor. And density-dependent factors are these factors that are directly dependent upon the size of a population. These are usually biotic factors in nature. These are factors that are affected by other living things. So an example, here's some wildebeest crossing a river. And imagine this river has 20 crocodiles in it. Well, if this particular, and, and all 20 of those crocodiles are going to get a wildebeest, by the way. Well, if this particular population is 10,000 wildebeests, Minus 20 really doesn't affect the population very much. But if the population is 50, then that population loses 40% of its population. It's a very density-dependent factor. Think again about disease. Let's take Wyoming and New York City again. If a disease hits New York City, it's going to spread rapidly because people are just literally back-to-back -back in New York City. Everyone's on top of one another. Whereas if a disease hits a small area in Wyoming, it might not spread at all because people aren't living together so closely. It's very sparsely populated. So it's a density dependent factor. Whereas density independent factors are factors that are the same, that have equal effect regardless of population size. These are typically abiotic factors. Example, the forest fire. A forest fire indiscriminately destroys everything in the forest, whether the forest is 10 or whether the population is 10 or 10,000. The fire equally affects all population densities. Everything is affected by the forest fire. Everything is affected by a flood or an earthquake. Population densities aren't that important. Sure, more people might die in a city that has a fire or a flood, but the flood equally destroys everything. It doesn't, the population isn't really at, at play. And so that brings us to another concept, growth rate. Growth rate is just the rate at which the population grows. It is dependent upon four different concepts, and one of those, or two of those are real simple to think about, birth and death. As people are born, populations go up, 
as people die, populations go down, and how those two things interact with one another are very important to a whole population. Here's a map of the world, and the countries that are in red are growing rapidly, the countries that are in blue are declining, and the yellow and green are kind of the in-betweens there. And so you can look at this and you can tell very quickly which countries are declining. More people are dying in those countries than are being born. Conversely, took look at the continent of Africa, for instance, more people are being born in those countries than are dying. And so you can look at the growth rate, or you can look at the birth and deaths and tell a lot about the growth rate of a place. Two other factors that have to do with growth rate are immigration and emigration. Immigration is when an organism moves into a population, and emigration is when an organism moves out of a population. And so if more are coming in than are leaving, that population is growing. If more are leaving than are coming than are coming in, population is declining. And so immigration, emigration, births and deaths all have to do with the growth of a population. And so now we'll look at two different growth models. One of those is called exponential growth, something we've looked at before. This is when a population doubles continually. This is likely due to the fact that there's no limiting factors in that population. Nothing is keeping it from growing. Many more are being born than are dying. Oftentimes the exponential growth is called a J-shaped curve because, well, it looks like a J. All right. And so you'll, you may see that term associated with exponential growth. Another type of growth is called logistic growth. And logistic growth is more of this S-shaped curve right here. And this S-shaped curve has to do with the fact that this population is going to grow for a time, but then it's going to level off as it reaches some sort of limiting factor, as it reaches some sort of thing that causes the population to be slowed down. Maybe there's not enough food, maybe there's some sort of disease or illness or predation if you're like a squirrel or something. And so the population is being limited. Which brings us to this next concept of carrying capacity. You can see here on this graph, carrying capacity is represented by the K. It's this line here. And carrying capacity is the amount of a population that an ecosystem can support. Very similar to this bucket that can only support so much water. You can see there accidents and disease and starvation, predators, old age, etc. All these different things represent limiting factors that are keeping the population from overflowing. And if you were to eliminate one of those, you could increase the sides of the barrel and more water could be fit in there, for instance. And so the its ability a population or an ecosystem's ability to support a certain number has to do with these limiting factors in the population. And so oftentimes you'll see a graph that looks like this. The carrying capacity is K, the S-shaped curve. In nature, this is typically what you see. Now, graphs don't look really nice and neat like this. Normally they look something like this, where the population kind of squiggles around this area here. And the ecologists can say, well, the population is probably some, or the carrying capacity is probably somewhere in the middle there. If the carrying capacity of an ecosystem, or if an organism exists very long over the carrying capacity of an ecosystem, they can do damage to that ecosystem. And this could lower the carrying capacity and then cause that population to crash. Humans, for instance, have grown exponentially for the last thousand years, and we've eliminated certain limiting factors in our uh, ecosystem, our world. We no longer have to worry about food and disease and shelter, at least in, in this part of the world. Other parts of the world, those are very present needs. But in this part of the world, we don't have to worry about those things. And so what are we doing to our ecosystem? We are we're damaging it because we are way above our carrying capacity. And you see this in other areas where we've artificially eliminated limiting factors and caused populations to crash. And we are learning more and more 
about these natural balances that exist in ecosystems.